Hello, I hope everybody's having a good day and that you are getting to enjoy. Uh, you know, like we keep on having a little bit of spring and then we go back into winter and it's almost like this is becoming harassment as far as the winter uh, goes. But I hope everybody's having a good day. And maybe you can enjoy the sunshine and even though it may be cooler today that you can enjoy the, the beginning of spring coming just around the corner. But I appreciate you tuning in to this program is being brought to you by the Lyak Road Church of Christ. Our building is located at 1687 Lyak Road in Litchfield, Kentucky. On Sunday mornings, we have Bible classes at 9.30, then worship at 10.25, and at 5 p.m. we have worship again. On Wednesday nights at 5 p.m., uh, 6 p.m., we have Bible classes. We have a gospel meeting coming up uh, with Josh McKibben, and that will be on March 26th through 29th. And uh, he will be uh, presenting some lessons about the Christian atheist. And so if you can, come be with us. We would appreciate you taking the effort uh, to be there. And we would uh, treat you like friends and family, which you are. And hopefully you'll put all of our Bibles and see what the Word of God says. But at this time, we want to look at a lesson last week. And uh, if you go onto YouTube and look at the lesson right before this one here, there's the title of When Less is More. And now it's making a point that there's times whenever we're better off not doing something, when we do things beyond what the Word of God says, when we add to the Word of God, when we do something uh, that we don't have scriptural authority, either for the idea we feel a compulsion to do this, as if we just have to, and or maybe God's convenience, or maybe cause of arrogance or pride on our part, that we are actually better off and not doing those things and doing less is better because we're staying within what the Word of God teaches, the parameters of the Word of God. I got to think about that a little bit and realize some people may look at that uh, title and some people may even listen to the lesson and walk away thinking, okay, what Dennis says is I need to do as little as I can and search to God. Therefore, because if I do, the less I do, the better off I am. The less I do, the less likely it is that I'm transgressing God's law. That's not the idea yeah, of that lesson. That was not an idea. But I got to think about the need for balance here in the subject matter. And so this lesson here is thought when more is better, or maybe a subtitle would actually when better is actually better. And that is that there are times in the Bible we find that people did that which was on an individual basis, which God approved of, and it was better. And let me give, you know, to start off here, we're talking about the fulfilling of vows. Uh, and that we talk about in the Old Testament, for instance, in Leviticus 7, verse 16. Leviticus 7, verse 16 says, But the sacrifice of his offering is a vow or a voluntary offering. It should be eaten the same day they offer the sacrifice. But on the next day, the remainder of it may also be eaten. And what I notice there is, in particular, that phrase there, a voluntary offering. There were certain offerings that was commanded under the law of Moses. The giving of a tenth for the tithing was a commanded offering. But this here deals with that which was voluntary. And there are certain vows that people make, and that we may make today, which we are expected to keep. And it's not necessarily commanded by the law, but it is allowed by the law. Over in Ecclesiastes 5, verse 5, Psalm says, Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. You know, we, we think about that. And we have some examples of vows in the Bible uh, that people made. Uh, we think about, for instance, Jephthah. And uh, in thinking about Jephthah and Judges, we automatically think about the rash vow he made. And we're about ready to go to battle, and he makes his vow that whatever comes out of his house, he will make a sacrifice to God. Now, I, there's some debate among people as far as whether or not he literally killed his daughter or not or that she was uh, isolated for the rest of her life. And, and whichever side on that you, you take, we just have to keep in mind that Jetha kept that vow. He kept this vow that he had made. And when dealing with the children of Israel, whenever they approached him to be their judge or to rule over them, uh, they made a vow to him that they would follow after him. He held them, and he told, tells them, Judges, the uh, 11th chapter, verse 9, 10, he tells them, I'm going to hold you to this vow. You know, they didn't have to come to Jephthah and make that promise to him. They did that voluntarily, and Jephthah is saying to them, you are bound by your vow you're taking. 
And there are times when we look at this and understand that people made a promise and they were expected to keep that promise. We may think of this in the marriage vows, that when people make that, uh, that, that promise, and again, nobody may should get married, but when you make that promise, then God expects you to keep that promise. Now, in New Testament, uh, we find, or excuse me, in Old Testament, we find another vow to talk about, and that is the Nazarite vow. And if you look in Judge, uh, Numbers, the sixth chapter, which deals almost, the whole chapter deals with this Nazarite vow. And this is the first time we read about it in the Bible. And as you look at it, and I'm going to quote a source here on the internet that talks about what that actually was. And first of all, I said the Nazarite vow is, a, is taken by individuals who have voluntarily, I think that's a key word here, voluntarily dedicated themselves to God. This is a decision, action, and desire on the part of people. His desire is to yield themselves to God completely. There's a purpose here. There is a reason behind this. This is a voluntary again. By definition, the Hebrew word Nazar means separated or consecrated. So they are voluntarily to make this vow is going to distinguish them from other people. And it says there are five features of this vow. Number one, the individual enters this vow voluntarily. Again, that word keeps on coming up here. The Bible says, speak to his rights and say them a, a man or woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of separation of the Lord as a Nazarite. That's Numbers 6, verse 2. So it's voluntary. The second is both men and women could participate in this vow. Again, look at Numbers 6, verse 2. It says a man or woman, therefore, it could be either sex that could make the vow. Now, Yes, Numbers uh, points out to us uh, the Nazarite vow was often taken by men and women, also purely for personal reasons, such as thanksgiving for recovery from illness or for the birth of a child. How under, however, under the Na uh, Mosaic law, the vow or oath of a single woman could be rescinded by her a father and that of a married woman by her husband. And that's number third chapter. In other words, if you look at that chapter that you have a daughter, that makes a vow. Her father could actually nullify it. If a married woman made this vow, her husband could nullify it. Okay, so they're, they're, they kind of have right oversight of this here. It goes on to say, Nazarite vows to often take by men and women alike purely for personal reasons, such as thanksgiving or recovery for illness. Uh, and it goes on to say, the oath of a civil woman could be rescinded by her husband. Okay, I already read that. So I'll kind of repeat that a little bit there. The third thing, the vow has a specific time frame. That is a beginning and an end. As the look at in the, in Numbers uh, 6, verse 8, it says, Throughout the period of his separation, he has consecrated the Lord. You know, the period of his separation, which means there will be an end to this. If you look down verse thirty, or verse 13, it said, Now this is the law of Nazareth, right when the period of separation is over. And so it was, as a general rule, a value took for a specific time period. And also, there were specific guidelines of this Nazarite vow. It wasn't just up to the person to decide what, what this Nazarite vow actually entailed. If you look in number 6, verse 3 through 7, you don't find some things such as that he or she was to abstain from wine or any fermented drink, nor was the Nazarite to drink grape juice or eat grapes or raisins. Not even the skins, uh, or Caesar skins of the raisins. Now, again, that's something that everybody else was protecting of, but you were making a special vow. Next, the Nazarite was not to cut his hair or the length of the uh, for the length of the vow. So you let your hair grow out. Okay, so uh, so that's another part of it. And third thing was they could not go near a dead body because that wouldn't make him ceremonially unclean. Now, on the law of Moses. Touching a dead body made you unclean anyway, and you had to go through the process of purification. And again, I'll limit time of that. But in this case here, if a husband or a wife or a mother, father, brother, you know, a relative dies, you do not even have the option of taking care of the body. You were to abstain from doing that. And therefore, that's part of the vow. And the final part of the vow was that in number 6, verse 13 to verse 20, it said the procedure for to go, at the end of the vow, a sacrifice was made, verses 13 through 17. The candace hair was cut off, 
and put on an altar, and the priest did the final task of putting the sacrificial process, which ended the vow. And so, and you look for <clears throat> number six, verse 21 says, <clears throat> This is the law of the Nazarite, whose vows is offering to the Lord in accordance with the separation. In addition, whatever he, else he can afford, he must fill the values made according to the law of the Nazarite. So, this again, this is a vow that, you know, that was voluntary, but involved a lot. These five things that uh, talked about this vow. Now, New Testament it kind of carries over in a sense that while the term Nazarite vow is not used, most people believe that in Acts 18, verse 18, this was referred to. And you look over in Acts 18, verse 18, it says, So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed over Syria and Priscilla and Aquila with him. He had cut his hair off and sent to Korea, for he had taken a vow. Doesn't specifically say this was a Nazarite vow, but he had taken a vow to not cut his hair off. If you go on in Acts the twenty first chapter, verse twenty three and twenty four, as Paul's at Jerusalem, and the brethren there said, Therefore do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them, be purified with them, and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads, and that all may know that these things which were formed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also will order and keep the law. And what, what the, this response to is there are some of uh, the brethren, some of the Jews that were saying Paul is speaking Ill, evil or ill of the law of Moses. And it's just kind of pointing out here that they're going to show them you respect the law of Moses, and, and this vow is part of that. Now, not as part of the law of Christ, but more along the lines of part of the custom of the vow itself, which will volunteer again. So when I read through these things, I just keep this in mind. And as we see the idea of, of a vow being made, which was not part of the law of Christ, but also it did not contradict the law of Christ. It's not something, for instance, that they did in substitution what Christ had to do, or in addition to what Christ had to do. It's something totally on their own. Okay, and so we have this idea of the vow. Keep, and we may just simply say, when we make a promise, and it may not be one that we are obligated to keep, but we make a promise, we are to keep it, as long as it does not contradict the law of Christ, as long as it does not add to the law of Christ. Now, go on, though, and again, we're talking about when more is better. And I see this here in the building of the tabernacle, when we go back to the Old Testament. If you go back to the Old Testament, in Exodus, the 35th chapter, you have the pattern given earlier in Exodus about the tabernacle. We have uh, men dedicated to the making of the tabernacle. And finally, it's time to actually make the tabernacle. Okay, so Exodus number uh, 35, and starting verse 21, is that then everyone whose heart was stirred and everyone whose spirit was willing, they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle meeting for all service and for the holy garments. They made both men and women as many as had a willing heart, and you know, maybe one of the phrases underlined there, a willing heart, and brought earnings and no, or earrings and nose rings, uh, rings and necklaces, all jewelry of gold, that as every man who made an offering of gold to the Lord, and every man with whom was found purple, a blue purple and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat's head, red skins of rams, and a bronze. And badger skins brought them. Verse 24. Everyone who offered an offering of silver or bronze for the Lord's offering, everyone with whom there was found acacia wood for any work of the service brought it. And all the women who were gifted, uh, artisans, uh, spun yarn with their hands and brought what they had spun, a blue, a purple, and scarlet, and fine linen. Verse 26. And all the women whose hearts stirred with wisdom a spurned a yard of goat's heart, uh, hair. The rulers brought onyx stones, and the stones be set in ephah on the breastplate, and the spices and oil for the lightning, for the anointing oil for the sweet incense. The children of Israel were brought free will offering the Lord. All the men and women whose hearts were willing to, to bring material for all kinds of work which the Lord, by the hand of Moses, had commanded to be done. As so I read that passage there, there's some key words that come down. One was, the hearts were stirred. They were felt compelled, we may say, to do this. And, and they were told to do this, but else more than that, there are things, sometimes things we do simply out of service dedication, sometimes because we are wanting to do that. We are enthused about doing it. And knowing this, but the Spirit was willing. 
that they were wanting, again, wanting to do this, kind of tied those two things together. And so they are doing this. And, and again, when you just read through this here, that they brought, you know, they, they gave freely. And so when you go down to Exodus 36 and verses 5 and 6, it says, I'm just talking about the men who was actually involved in the making of the Ark of the Covenant and all the utensils and everything according to, uh, work, you know, connected with the tent of meeting. And said, and they brought, the, and they spoke to Moses saying, the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded us to do. So Moses gave a commandment, and they caused to be proclaimed throughout the whole camp, saying, let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. And all people were restrained from bringing, for the material they had was sufficient for all the work to be done. <clears throat> to be done indeed too much. And so look at this here and just think about the fact that they had brought more than enough. And they had brought so much fat that it was, it was starting to be a hindrance, getting in the way. And so they said they had to restrain them. They had to, had to tell them just stop it. Just stop. Now what they're doing is they're, they're going to do more than what they had to do, but they're doing it willingly again. And if you go to New Testament, I kind of have a parallel account of this, not dealing with the Ark of the Covenant or the Tabernacle, but a question being made for the needy saints in Jerusalem. And you look at St. Corinthians 8, chapter 3, and the church of Macedonia says, For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, where they were freely willing and pouring with as much urgency that we should receive the gift and fellowship of the ministry of the saints. And not only as we had hope, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Now notice here in this collection, he said there's a need for it, and they gave more than what we expected, but one of the key phrases here is that they first gave themselves to the Lord. You know, once we decide to give ourselves to the Lord, then it becomes easier to give. It becomes easier in what we have to give. And so we go down to St. Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verse 7, and talking and says, So oh, let each one give us a purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or the necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And that is, they were giving with purpose. They were giving from their hearts. Now, again, I can't kind of think about this with Moses. Moses was not having to go to the children of Israel and plead with them for, for more supplies. He didn't have to go to them and say, well, folks, we need more gold. Uh, we need more silver. We need more badger skins. We need more, and we just need more. He didn't have to do that. There wasn't a telethon Moses had to do to try to get people to give more for the tabernacle. They had already given enough and more than enough. Here, in the churches of Macedonia, helping the needy saints, again, that's the idea here, is that they were giving more than what Paul had ever expected. But why? Because And, and he's praised them, not necessarily about the amount, but because they had purpose in their hearts, because they were giving cheerfully. And it's the thing about this, it's easy to read this passage, uh, and both passages, really. It's th easy to read Exodus and here in St. Corinthians 8 and 9. And I think of this in economic terms. And it's easy to re maybe relate this to the idea of the worst, uh, you know, the collection plate. And and think, well, then it's the same. We need to give more. We need to write bigger checks. We need to give more money. That's not really what this is about. What it's about is the spiritual idea here. And that's we need to give more in the idea of teaching, maybe of volunteering to teach more, to preach, to help others, to encourage others, to be a more service to God. We need to think, think about what is it I can do more so as to make the church better where I attend at, to be better equipped. I think of congregation. I think of congregation where the elders, instead of maybe having to get up in front of the congregation, plead with people for uh, somebody help them vacation Bible school or somebody to help teach a class or somebody help to take care of, you know, to take somebody to a doctor that needs a ride to a doctor. Imagine instead of doing that, imagine a congregation with the elders to tell the folks, folks, I tell you what, we have, we have so many Bible class teachers, we don't have to ask you to, you know, to hold off a little bit, but we'll, we'll get around to you. Eventually, we'll be able to teach Bible class. We've just got too many Bible class teachers. Or, or that we have uh, more than enough to teach uh, or preach this Sunday, or we have 
more than enough, um, you know, to do all these other works of benevolence that need or to take care of the needy widows type type work. And imagine where they could say that. And I'm aware that probably there are probably ours in the congregation where they you know, specify some of these things, but in this case here, more is better. If I can ask, what more can I do? That'd be better. And also think about more is better in other areas. And that is more is better when we're talking about being peacemakers, when seeking peace with other people. Matthew 5 and verse 9 said, Bless our peacemakers, for they should be called sons of God. Now, it took me a while as a Christian to really grasp this idea of being a peacemaker. And it's not the idea of compromising the Word of God. It's not the idea of giving in to sin or giving in to worldliness. But it's the idea, again, of striving to have the right relationship with God and with my brethren. And we see, as you look at this here, that sometimes the spiritual application of this is missed. And if you go down to Matthew 5, verse 40, we see an application here. It says, if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. You know, it compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Now, Jesus is making some application here. We may look at this here and, and kind of miss it by saying, you try to go the extra mile. You try to go the extra mile to have peace, to ha have the right relationship with your brethren. And, so, and, and again, that's, that's good. Whenever we uh, try to have the patience, try to have the endurance to do that. Because a lot of times, People get fed up and they say, I've had enough. And, and just that. Well, he said, no, you try to be the peacemaker. And being righteous. And being righteous. Now, obviously, being righteous is a good thing. Matthew 5th chapter, verse 18. And we read through verse 18 through verse 20. And there Jesus says, so For sure I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one child or one tittle by, will by no means pass the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so that it will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he should be called great in the kingdom of God. For I say to you, now this is the key here, for I say to you, you know, when Paul would have therefore in his writings, he had to underline that and say, what's he making the application of? Well, that's what Jesus did. For I say to you, here's what the law of Moses says, but here I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharise scribes Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You stop thinking about what he's saying here. And by some natural response to that, we may ask, well, what's wrong? Well, what's wrong with the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? And so there's some things Jesus pointed out in the Sermon on the Mount and later on in his ministry. Some of those things was that they were doing things to be external, to be seen by men. And that's the only reason why they, they want other people to see them, whether it's fasting or giving or their prayers, that they were doing this so other people would see me being righteous. They were doing things because it was self-serving. They wanted people to come up to you and pat you on the back and say, oh, brother so-so or, or sister so-so, I praise you because of how good you are, how righteous you are, how golly a person you are. And that's, that's why they were doing it. Or also, in the case of they looked at the letter, but not the spirit of the law. And that is, they looked and said, okay, here's what the law says. But they were not keeping, as Jesus says, they tithed men and as a coming, but they, they were not keeping the way your marriage law, love, justice, and mercy. And so our righteousness has to exceed that. And instead of being doing things so as to be seen, I mean, we need to do, do things, even when people are not looking. We need to do things because we want to be seen by God as doing what's righteous. Uh, him to see us, not other people. We want to do things that instead of self-serving, that is serving others, where we are serving them instead of serving ourselves. Well, we don't care if they praise us or not. We don't care if somebody uh, pats on the back and says how righteous we are. We, we know we're doing the right thing. We, we want to be serving us. We need, instead of just keeping the letter of law, we need to understand what the spirit of the law is, what the love, justice, and mercy of the law really is, and do it because of that. And so, our, it's more is better when we're talking about more righteous than the Pharisees. And finally, more is better when we talk about growth. When we talk about growth, the church of Thessalonica well, had a lot of good things uh, going on there. And Paul, in fact, commends them a lot in this letter. He commends them because how they sounded forth the word of God in the first chapter. 
how they held their traditions handed to them by Paul in second chapter of First Thessalonians. And it goes on and, and in fourth chapter, verse one, fourth chapter, verse one, he says, Finally, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ that you should, should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please God. If you go down to the fourth chapter, uh, excuse me, fourth chapter, verse 10, the last part of verse 10, is, but we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. The numeric standard says that you excel even more. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying, brethren, you're doing great. Brethren, we understand you're preaching the word, you're holding to the word, you're exhibiting what a Christian should be, you're standing up for the truth, and he said, and you know what? That is great. But you can do better. You can excel still more. It's kind of like, taking this principle a little bit, and there's been a number of times that somebody in the family will make something, a dessert or something, uh, you know, some kind of food at a potluck or a, just a get-together, and there's been a number of times that I would tell them, I said, you know, this is really good, but you know what? I bet you could do it better. And I, I know, and next, I, I know I'm just give you the opportunity to do it better next time. You know, you know keep on encouraging them to do more and more. That's what Paul's doing here. And that's what we need to be trying to do is excel still more. You see, growing is a never-ending process. And it can be a challenging process. And we have to be willing to accept the new challenges and learn to do new things and and take the time to do these things. But Paul said, brethren, I want you to excel still more. And, and so there is a case where more is better when we're excelling still more. To do more in service to God is not trying to earn our salvation. I don't want to give that impression either. Borrow love for God should be seen in how we are serving him. How about you? Are you trying to excel still more and more? Hopefully so. Hopefully this encourages encourage each one of us to see what more we can do in the Lord's service. I appreciate you watching. Now, of course, to do more in the Lord's service, first of all, we have to be in the Lord. We have to understand what a Christian is, and that is that when we hear the gospel of Christ as the means by which man is saved, Romans 1 verse 16, and that we must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We must be willing to repent of our sins, confess Jesus Son of God, be baptized for remission of our sins, and then be faithful to the Word of God. If you haven't done those things, then I'd be glad to sit down with you and talk to you about what all that means in case you're, you're kind of thinking, I don't know what really this is talking about. But I want to help you in order to become what God wants you to be, in, in order to become a Christian, in order to have the hope of heaven. If we can do that anyway, why don't you let me know. I appreciate you watching. Again, come be with us. Like Road. 1687 is the location of our building in Litchfield, Kentucky. Sunday morning's Bible class, we have uh, 9.30. Worship at 1025. Sunday at 5 p.m. we have worship in it. On Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. we have Bible classes. Thank you for watching.